Hello and welcome to my deck review of how to play Sabine Cunning and kind of my deck tech card by card on Sabine. Um, there are a lot of versions of Sabine going out, going around right now. There's green Sabine, um, there's just mono aggression Sabine, um, which seem to be more popular than this version. Um, I have kind of stuck with the original version of Cunning Sabine, and there have been some new cards that have come out that I've incorporated into it, and I've put in a lot of games, a lot of testing, and I feel like the Cunning version of Sabine is actually the most versatile version which I'll kind of go through in a little bit here. Um, I'm going to go through each card, um, kind of the thought thought process behind of each card and where there are some areas for optimization still. So starting out, I'm just going to show you the whole list. I will actually link the entire list in the description, uh, but this is what it looks like from a high level. Um, and I'm going to go through each card by cost to breakdown. Um, but yeah, definitely check out the list in the description if you want to try it out in Force Table or if you want to copy my list for Tabletop Simulator. All right. So first off, Benthic Two Tubes. There's only one copy in my deck. Um, this card is actually not super great. I don't like it, um, but it is in here for the Mirror Match. So the other versions of Sabine, um, either Mirror Match or other colors of Sabine or other Leia decks that are also aggressive, this card, a lot of times you're not really battling units. You're kind of both trying to do as much damage to face as possible directly to the base. Um, in some cases you are sort of controlling the other person, but Benthic Two Tubes adds a lot of aggression. If you can attack with Benthic Two Tubes and give one of your other units raid two, a red unit, uh, raid two, that, that represents four damage on a one drop. That's a lot of extra damage. What makes this card bad is that, let's say, Benthic Two Tubes attacks, he gives a buff to somebody else for your next attack, your opponent can easily remove that other unit, um, so it's not super great. But having one copy does give you the option to play it or sideboard it out in different matchups. I do like that it's really fast, it's a fast card, it has synergy with events, which I'll get to in a little bit, and it is a rebel. So those are all positive attributes, there are downsides to the card, but I think having one copy in the deck is justified. Having more, not so much. You don't really want to see two because it is a unique unit, you can't have two on the board at the same time. Um, if, you, if you don't know, the little star up at the name here, that signifies it's a unique unit. All right, next, Chopper. Again, this is the cunning version of Sabine. So I have access to a lot of cards that the other versions of Sabine are not playing. Um, it's a rebel, which is great, but you see one three on its stat line, and I think it's just an absolute mistake in this deck to see it as a one three. It's effectively a two three. Um, this deck has seven different uh, ways to get specters onto the battlefield, and one of them is guaranteed every single game, that being my actual leader, Sabine, as a specter. So this unit will actually get raid one uh, almost every time I play it. And the on attack trigger here is really scary against a lot of my opponents, especially control or boba decks. They're very afraid if I get attack with chopper and I tap one of their one of their resources, they won't be able to play their five drop or their four drop. And that could literally mean game over for them. If they miss the right play, the optimum play once against me, that spells disaster that literally is the entire game it's you know of course i still have to win the game but the game you know story writes itself and i kid you not every time i play this my opponent has to destroy it because if i can get that on attack trigger to actually discard an event um and i can exhaust one of their lands or one of the resources that is incredibly crippling against those decks they need every resource they can get against aggro and i have a tempo card that shuts that down what's interesting though is um, the decks that this does well against, they also have a lot of events. Most Boba and Iden decks are running anywhere between 25 to 40% of their deck being events, which means I almost always have a one third shot, a one in three shot of hitting it. And there have been many games where I have hit it. They have four open resources. I shut one of the resources down. They have no turn three play. They have to take initiative and I just get to attack in for free and they get nothing out of the turn. Um, it is it is quite a good card. I can't overestimate it, how good, how good it is. I think this card was wildly underestimated and I think it was seen as not playable because 
oh, it's a one three and it's it needs a specter. And, you know, in Sabine, maybe, but you have to play cunning Sabine. But there are more than there's more than one specter in the deck. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But this card is an all star. I love to see this in my opening hand and I love to play it with, I believe, the next card. Um, Spec Force Soldier. So this card has a lot of utility. It's just in here against Sentinel decks. It's a one drop. It's a two, two. Um, it's really, really good. I, I actually almost play this card as an event more than a unit. And that's, that's a huge concept to understand that sometimes this card has no impact on winning the game by itself with its power and toughness. Rather its effect when it's played will unlock your ability to win that turn by shutting down their key sentinel unit, you can then attack in for that remaining damage. And so this card often is played as, oh, this is actually more of an event effect than it is a unit and it just so happens to also be a unit. But it is also nice to have it early so you have the flexibility to play it as a one drop uh, early. The next card is Leia. This card is a two drop, but I feel like that's also a mistake. Uh, it is a 2-2, but when it's played, you can ready a resource or an exhaust a unit. So it technically is a 2-drop, but I do put it here because I often will play a Leia, untap a land, play a chopper. That is really hard for your opponent to deal with. They often have no way to deal with it on the next turn, um, meaning they have no way to take out both the units. In a lot of cases, um, they need a Greedo, which is, you know, if they have magical Christmas land answers, then they have magical answers, and you can't beat magic. So... Um, you know, you can play Leia, play Benthic, play Leia, play Spec Force. Uh, I play three copies of Spec Force, three copies of Leia, one copy of Benthic, and uh, two copies of Chopper in the deck. Lots of utility. The last one drop here is, I think, the most important card that was revealed in the last month before the full set was revealed is Rebel Assault. You'll notice this is a green command heroism card, green white card. Um, this card is insane. Um, I think. Seeing it as a green card is a mistake. Just imagine this costed three and was factionless. You would still play it. It is that good. You get to attack with a rebel unit and it gets plus one plus oh for the attack. And then you get to attack with another unit and it gets plus one plus oh for the attack. This has a lot of synergy with Benthic because you can attack with Benthic, resolve his on attack trigger, and then attack with that red aggression unit right away in the same action. So this often will win you the mirror match it will often get you that burst potential to take your opponent from 15 to 25. Um, I have won many games against Boba Green, against Aiden Green, where they think they're sitting pretty at 15. I play this card, target my two most powerful units, and I attack in for 10 damage and end the game out of nowhere. Um, it often feels like the Exodia piece where you just play it and you win on the spot. Um, you have to sequence your cards correctly. You can't just play this whenever you want. It has to be played at the right time. And so I only play two copies because you only want to play one of these a game. You res if you draw two, you resource one. Um, I've just noticed that you, you almost never want to play multiple copies of this card because it's used as a finisher. It's used to, you know, execute your opponent, take them from 15, 16, all the way up to 25 damage if they're not playing a 30 life base and end the game on the spot. All right, so now we're gonna move to two drops here. Um, Lothal Insurgent, not much to say, it's a three two, it's efficient, it gives you three power on turn one. And when it's played, if another card was played this phase, each opponent draws a card then discards a card at random. Surprisingly, this has made my opponent discard the answer they needed. Um, I've almost never had it actually give them something. Um, it all, almost always gets them to draw like a early, you know, in the late game if I play this, they end up drawing a card which ends up being like a cheap early game card, which is irrelevant. And then they end up discarding their bomb and that often spells disaster. So I really like this card could be cut in the future because it is in, in a lot of circumstances, a three, two rebel vanilla, um, not bad, but not great. Next is Sabine, which is what you want to see on a two drop. It's got a two, three, it's got an on attack trigger. Um, that lets you do a damage to the unit you're attacking or to the base that you're attacking. Um, so she does three damage to a base directly, or if you're attacking a unit, let's say it's a two, two, you can attack in with Sabine, do two with her power, and then you can redirect one of those damage to the base. Um, so she lets you split the math up, which is really nice. And also because it's an attack trigger, her one damage ping to a defender will actually make them drop their shield. So a lot of early shielded tokens, shielded units, you just play Sabine. 
Um, you tack in with Sabine, ping off the shield, kill it with the two, and then Sabine takes two damage in return and she survives. Very powerful. And that little sneaky ability there, while there are at least three aspects among other friendly units, this unit can't be attacked unless she gains Sentinel, which is irrelevant. Um, she's also a Spectre and a Rebel, both relevant um, typal, tribal uh, subtypes here. Yeah, so she's a great card. I mean, there have been games where she can't be attacked because I have a bunch of space units that have three aspects and my opponent has a massive ground ground unit army and they just can't attack Sabine. She's invincible. Um, really insane, really, really insane card there. Next is Alliance X-Wing. It's a 2-3 and allows you to lane dodge in space. Nothing else to say here and it's a rebel. And then A-Wing, which is arguably the best two drop in the game. It's a 1-3 that attacks for three. Um, there's really no other card and it's in space, so you can play it on turn one, which is like flying in this game, right? Comparing it's like magic. You just, space is really hard to compete in early. This card's insane. Um, it often gets in six damage before it's answered. It's just a very, very strong card and allows you to lane dodge. So lane dodging is where, you know, if your opponent is going ground, if you're the aggro deck, you don't care where they go, you want to go where they're not. And so you can play in space so that you can just keep attacking face uncontested. Very strong card. Next is Surprise Strike. Attack with the unit, it gets plus three, plus zero for attack. Burst potential. I mean, my goodness, putting a Surprise Strike on an A-Wing that's six damage, that ends up being roughly 30% of somebody's life total or 25% of their life total in a lot of games. Um, that's very, very strong. You can end games out of nowhere with this card. And this card I think is better than Rebel Assault because um, you do want to see more than one copy because you don't need multiple units to get it to work. You just need a glass cannon to victory. You need one unit, any unit in your deck is good enough. Put it on that unit, smash in, do a bunch of damage. In a lot of cases too, you can use this to like execute their leader if their leader is causing problems. You can give it to one of your lower end creatures, buff it up enough to trade with a leader. And then if your opponent has no board, then you're uncontested for, for the rest of the game, which is really strong. All right, so moving to three drops here. Uh, Ezra Bridger, this card is often talked about in as it's really bad. I think it's a card that could be cut. Um, I do like that it's a Rebel and a Spectre, so both relevant types there. Uh, it's a 3-4, so it does help out Chopper with the Spectre there. And when it completes an attack, look at the top card of your deck. You may play it, discard it, or leave it on top of your deck. It's not just card advantage. It's card selection. And I love this card because it allows you to look at the top card of your deck. Do you want to see that card next turn? Maybe you can't play it, but do you even want to see that card? If that's a card you don't want to see, you bin it into the into your discard pile and you are curating your draws for the matchup. Very, very strong. Obviously, the best play in the game is you play Ezra. Um, next turn, you attack with Ezra. You show a surprise strike. You play it on one of your early cards and you get two actions in one. That is like Christmas land. That does happen very often in the deck. Um, but a lot of times you might want to bin an early chopper. Hey, I don't want to see a chopper anymore. I want to see a Millennium Falcon so you can bin it. Um, there's a lot of times where I attack with Ezra. I look at the top card. It's a K2. On turn, on turn three, I have four resources. Hey, I'll play a K2 for free. or not, not for free, but without having to draw it. And then you get to go deeper into your deck for more answers. And I think that's why Ezra is so good. He allows you to scry, he allows you to surveil, he allows you to play off the top. Surveil is in magic where you get to look at the top card of your deck and leave it there or bin it in the graveyard. And that's exactly what Ezra does. So Ezra, I think is very strong. Whenever you have card selection and card advantage in one, one effect, I think, you, I think it's a mistake to underestimate that. Next is Fleet Lieutenant, arguably the best card in the deck. It's a 3-3 three, three for 3, okay, great, not bad, but it allows you to go up on the action economy, meaning that when you play it, you get to take another action. So your action is playing this card, and he also gives you something else to do. And not only that, if you target a rebel, it also gets plus 2 attack for the attack. Um, what's really interesting with Fleet Lieutenant, um, you can attack, a lot of people make this mistake, but when you play Fleet Lieutenant, you can attack with anything but it just doesn't, it only gives the buffs to rebels. So the only non rebel in the deck is Millennium Falcon, which is next here, um, or it's, it's, it's gonna be in this list here. Uh, so you can actually attack with anything in the deck and give it plus two or give it, you get a free attack. It just doesn't give it plus two plus oh. Still, what's so good about this card is it adds two power to a unit, lets you attack with it, and it leaves a three, three body behind. 
that's just amazing. It, it, it ties into the existing bullet points here. It's burst potential. It allows you to get more damage faster and it drops more units that your opponent has to deal with. Next is a card that I've actually been testing with and I think is, is, is slept on is Rogue Operative. So the card that I actually cut from my list is Fighters for Freedom, which is a 3-4 with Saboteur. And that card had a, it was Aggression Heroism, so this is Cunning Heroism. And Fighters for Freedom actually has an effect. Whenever you play an Aggression card, a uh, red card, you can ping your opponent for one damage to their base. That is good in other lists. It's not good in this list. There's not that many Aggression cards. There's actually more non-Aggression cards in this deck than any other deck, um, Sabine deck. But what's interesting is even regardless of that, this, I, I misread this card originally. This card actually attacks in for four damage. And that is really, really strong on a turn two play to be able to attack in for four damage with no other buffs. I think this card is gonna put Cunning Sabine over the top. I haven't seen anybody playing it. I think it's the card to play. Um, I, I just mistakenly read, misread this card. I thought it was raid one and it's a raid two. So this card is, is actually quite strong. Um, could actually burst in for as much as a K2. Next is what I think is the best card in the game. You know, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's the best three drop in the game. I don't think anyone can possibly disagree with that. I think that this is still one of the best cards in the game. It's a three, four. Um, when it, it enters play ready, and um, when you ready cards during the regroup phase, you have to pay one to keep them out, or you have to return them to your hand. Sometimes you actually return them to your hand because he's got damage on them. You want to keep it around. Uh, but it basically has haste. It can attack in right away the turn you play it, which is goes into this deck's strategy, which is to be aggressive, to go fast, to go to face. And what's interesting, it's got four toughness. And if you look at all the three drops in the game, none of them have four power. Um, that are playable. This one can kill any space unit and live in the game. And what's interesting is if your opponent plays a space unit, you can play this and also attack before they can respond because their space unit will enter play exhausted. Um, so this card is just so insane. I love this card. I think it's why you play Cunning Sabine. I think it's the main reason. If this card didn't exist, I wouldn't be playing this list. Next is Red 3. This card uh, um, allows you to have more burst potential where it gives all of your friendly heroism units raid one. And I believe there's only one card in the deck that's not a heroism. And I think it's Benthic Two Tubes, um, which could you could arguably say might, might want to take them out of the deck for that. But this card, if you play it and it goes uncontested, it often adds like three or four extra damage to all of your units in that turn that you play it or maybe before it dies. And it's a very strong card. I love this card. It attacks in for three, and that buff is just so strong. <laughs> Next is Wing Leader. I love this card. It's a 2-1 for three. When you play it, give two experience tokens to another friendly rebel unit, which hits every single card in the game besides Millennium or card in the deck besides Millennium Falcon. Um, what's interesting is when you play this and buff one of your other guys, it gets around cards like Power of the Dark Side, uh, which says an opponent chooses a unit, they control, defeat that unit. <laughs> Um, so if you play this and then they play Power of the Dark Side, you can just sacrifice your wing leader and leave your super buffed guy uh, on the battlefield attacking for tons of damage. And so it gets around really strong removal cards in the game right now, and I think that's what makes wing leader so flexible. Um, and if your opponent bounces wing leader to your hand, you can always just replay it. It's just a really good card. Spreads that damage and allows you to go wide. Another card that I think is arguably one of the best cards in the game um, is for a cause I believe in. You reveal the top four cards of your deck. For each heroism card you reveal, deal one damage to an enemy base. You may discard any of them and put the rest back on top in any order. This is crazy. Um, man, if it didn't have that, if it didn't have that bottom thing, I don't think it would be as good, but it allows you to basically get rid of cards you don't want to see. It's card selection and damage in one. And like I said, with Ezra, it has the same effect. Um, this hits every single, every card in the deck is as a heroism card besides four cards, which is the three surprise strikes and one benthic two tubes. So the chance I believe of hitting all four heroism is like 93 or 94%, depending on what's been played in the game. Um, and I do keep track of that when I do play. Um, you always keep track of what cards you've played. So you know that the chances of hitting what you need, 
And what people do with this card is they play it and they bin a bunch of cards and they actually, you can actually sequence these together where you play one to search for the other one to search for the other one. You get to dig very deep in your deck for answers and for the cards you need to win. It just makes the card really insane. Even if you, sometimes people play this and they win on the spot, but sometimes they play it to find the card they need to win next turn. Um, it's just, it's a very strong card. Uh, K2. All right, so we're moving on to four drops here. Uh, as you can see, three drops make up most of this list here. Um, there's seven cards in the deck that are three, and I believe they're all played as three copies each. Next is K2. I mean, I don't really need to explain why this card is good. It's a four, four for four, which is kind of meh. It's not super great. It's meh, it's, it's good, it's not bad, it's not great, it's not bad. It has Overwhelm, which means that whenever he does damage to a unit, the excess damage is dealt to base. And when it's defeated, you do three damage to each opponent or make them discard a card from their hand. So this card is insane. It's a lose-lose situation. If they kill it, they're still taking three damage. Um, it's just very, very strong. Um, I, I, I think that's all that needs to be said about the card. It's just it's just good. They kill it. They get hurt. They don't kill it. They get hurt. That's what you want in, a, in an, an aggressive deck. Next is a Dodana. This is another card that I, I call playing as an event. It's a unit as an event. This feels like an Anthem effect you'd have on, you know, an event or something like that, giving all your friendly rebel units plus one, plus one until end of turn. But he actually just does it forever. He's what we call a Lord in Magic the Gathering. Um, he just pumps all the rebels. And like, I, and like I've mentioned multiple times, almost every unit in the deck is a rebel. And so this really mucks up your opponent's math. They often have to divert their attention and, and kill him right away, or they are gonna take a lot of excess damage. They're not gonna be able to do the two for one they thought they were gonna be able to do. And so I call it action dodging. What's really nice in this game is there are a lot of actions that can only target units with three or five toughness or less. And General Dodana can sometimes put Sabine over that five toughness mark and give her six toughness. And this card is just so good. I play only two copies of Dodana and four copies of K2, but Dodana is just such um, a versatile card where I actually play him late game on purpose to pump all my guys and kind of surprise my opponent with the additional power I, made it, I've, I was able to put onto the battlefield. So that is the main list. That's kind of my thought process behind each card, why I think it's good, how, how to play around certain things. Um, but let's talk about the base now. So Jetta City is a the cunning base I play. It gives you a once, once per game epic action where you can give a non-leader unit minus four, minus so. Um, this card is really, really, really good. So what you can do is you can actually shut down key units and give them zero power so that you can attack into them and kill them and not take any lethal damage in return or any damage for that matter. And what this is really good against is this is good against Sentinel. If they play a 3-3 three, three or a 3-4 with Sentinel, you just give it zero power. All of your units attack and kill it. You don't get punished, they get punished. And with Sabine, you're almost always, it's very flexible because with Sabine, you're almost never having the initiative because Sabine has, her leader ability is a ping. Every time you tap her or exhaust her on her leader side, you do a damage to each base. And so you're almost never having the initiative. So being able to pull all this together and kind of give something minus four, minus oh, attack into it, it's something you can do a lot. Um, in the mirror match, it's really good because you can just use it as a shutdown option, like boom, shut down that unit, make it do zero damage. And in the mirror matches, oftentimes it's one action that who determines the winner or loser. They're both capable of winning within one action. And if I can slow my opponent down just a little bit for free, then I can end up winning the game by just doing that one choice there. Uh, it allows you to, to shift the tempo as well by just changing the math up in the game. And then lastly, you can really shut down combos where some um, some decks really have these like combo elements where they can keep on tapping units and attacking with them. But what's nice is when you give something minus four, minus oh, if they untap it or whatever, it doesn't matter. It has minus four for the whole turn. So in a lot of, in a lot of cases, you can shut down units that have a ton of upgrades. Um, and so that can give you that tempo back. And then lastly, I like to think about this, this card as being 25 life plus four. What I mean by that is, is sometimes you can you know, minus four attack kind of means plus four life in, so, in some circumstances. And so to strictly evaluate this as a 25 life base, um, I, I kind of feel like it's probably should be seen as like somewhere in between 25 and 29, like 27 life. 
because this reduces attack power. And I, I think that's an interesting way to think about the card. Next is the leader, uh, Sabine. So she's a rebel and a specter. So she synergizes with everything that has typal synergy in the deck. She has a high starting toughness at five. Um, she's along with being the earliest deployed leader in the game and her ping, her ping effect here on screen is one of the most efficient uh, or one of the most in, uh, relevant effects that you can have in an aggro deck. Oftentimes her ping effect takes my empty board and they have a full board of 20 power about to kill me. Hey, I, I got the Sabine ping. I'm just going to do that last point of damage and, and, and finish you. Um, oftentimes that, that is what makes or breaks the entire game. And so I think that Sabine is, is probably the best aggro deck in the game. And I think she's S tier. I think this deck is S tier. Uh, a lot of people think she's not S tier. I think uh, based off my playing with it and playing other, other control decks, other Boba decks, other Sabine decks. I think that this deck has the highest chance of winning across all decks, like in the meta right now, if you were to go into a random tournament and play this, I think that you're more likely to win with this version of Sabine than any other version. And additionally, I think that this deck has the best odds at beating things like Boba and Aiden that are not Boba and Aiden. Those decks are just often mirror matching each other and it's a really bizarre, but I think Sabine can kind of get underneath them and finish them before they can do what they want to do. And that's why I think this deck is um, probably the best deck in Star Wars Unlimited. I, I personally would go out there and say that because of my own experience. I have about a 89% win rate with the deck right now, playing all types of players, um, keeping track of my score. Um, and then let's talk about the sideboard here. So this is where I think there's a lot of room for testing. I think the list I have, I don't even know if I would change anything. Maybe one card like Benthic Two Tubes, really hard to say but I wanna talk about the four cards I'm playing. So I play three copies of Greedo right now. It's really good against the Mirror Match. Um, that, the Mirror Match is really tough because they often have like the double red aggression Sabine is really good against me, but terrible against control because it has no resilience. Um, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. It's just a lot more lower to the ground. It's units are cheaper. They can often be board wiped easier. Um, Greedo is really good against that deck because he's a three, one for one. So I get to maintain that damage potential. Um, so I play three copies of it. Also, I find myself sometimes setting Greedo in. If I feel like I want to get rid of Benthic two tubes, I'll put in one Greedo and just see how that goes. Um, Wolf is against the life gain decks. I think it's pretty obvious when, when played and on attack, nobody can heal for the entire turn. Krennic, Iden, shut down healing. Sometimes against Boba, if they're playing the, the three, three, um, Starcraft that has uh, Restore 2 when you have the initiative. Playing three copies of Disabling Fang Fighter. Um, actually, two copies of Dis Disabling Fang Fighter. Uh, one played, you may defeat an upgrade. There are just some really weird combo decks out there that they try to give their unit a ton of upgrades, and sometimes they can just win because they're playing this Boggles slash Voltron style deck. Excuse me, and Disabling Fang Fighter is a unit that gets rid of those upgrades. Next is Asteroid Sanctuary. This is uh, Shields Against Ambush, right? Um, I love this card because against Boba, if you play it, um, you get to exhaust Boba on turn four when he comes out, which is the turn that Boba goes off, goes bonkers. And you can give a shield token to a friendly unit that costs three or less. And so when you give that shield token to one of your key units, like Falcon or Red Three um, or Rogue Operative, right? Those that basically makes your your unit immune to ambush and immune to overwhelming barrage. And so it just makes it really hard for your opponent to clear the board. And then you have another unit to just slam surprise strikes on and just get in for massive, ridiculous damage. And so this card comes in against ambush decks that play ECL. It comes in against Boba specifically because I think it's really good against Boba. Um, but that is my list. And I think this is where we can have the most iteration. Um, and I think that the other lists don't have as good of sideboards, the other Sabine lists, they just don't have a ton of options, but having access to cunning gives you access to all of these events and tricks that I've even thought about playing out maneuver against, um, Boba or Aiden when they, when they are late game, can I just shut down all their ground units for a full turn and let me get in more damage with space? I've legitimately thought about that. I think that in a lot of cases that might I need to test that out more and I'm curious what you guys think in the comments about the deck list. 
Um, I also put my link for this deck list in the uh, comments, and then I also put my link to um, my current standings. Uh, I think my name in the tournament is Ryan Warner, so you can see the, the data-backed findings from this deck. Um, so right now, I still think what's considered the best deck is Boba and Aiden, and I think this deck is number three, if not number two underneath Aiden, or above Aiden and beneath Boba. So let me know what you guys think about this, and definitely check out the links below. Please subscribe if you liked this, and leave me a comment and a like. Thanks.